We're now going to look at the abstract story behind our favorite example that we've just seen. Remember, our favorite example of a distributed law is about combining monoids and groups to make rings. So what we're going to do now is the main theorem that gives that. Now, it's worth, um, I should probably point out that I didn't, one thing I didn't say last time is that, that here's our favorite example, right? We take our, our parentheses like that, we multiply them out and we get this, and we get a distributive law going in this direction only. There's definitely something directional going on here. You can't take an arbitrary sum of products and necessarily factorize it like this. So we don't have something going this way. This is definitely a non-invertible sort of situation. Now, what that means for us in practice is that we have to remember which direction everything's going in. And that means, of course, that half the time we get it wrong and uh, we can't remember our lefts and rights and our ups and downs. But never mind. Um, it's just important to keep a slightly clear head about it. All uh, right, so here's the point. The main result for distributive law theory is that a distributive law, a distributive law lambda of S over T, is equivalent to, now remember what we said, that we can lift the free group monad to the category of commutative monoids. And abstractly, what we're doing there is we're lifting T to S alge. Is equivalent to a lift of T to a monad T prime on S alge. Um, remember that the other part of this story that we liked, the sort of subplot or parallel plot to the story, is that TS in our example became the free ring monad. So it gave us a way of constructing rings. And what we're going to do here is say that TS becomes a monad. Moreover, the algebras for TS were rings. And also, when we lift the free group monad to the category of commutative monoids, it turns out that the algebras for that are also rings, which is really rather well exciting, frankly. Um, and so TS alge is equivalent to T prime alge. So let's just Let's just think about this, this last part here. What, what would it mean for TS to become a monad? I mean, just forget about this abstract result for a second um, and think about having a monad T and a monad S. Is TS necessarily a monad? Hmm, well, what would it have to be to be a monad? We'd have to, okay, when is TS a monad? We need a multiplication. We need something from TS, TS, TS. Do we necessarily have such a thing? Well, oh, if only we could move S over T, then everything would be okay. Because then we could move S over T, and we'd get T squared, S squared, and then we could just hit it with the usual multiplication for T and multiplication for S. So all we need, what we need here is something from S T to T S. Hurrah! If we have a distributive law, then we've got one of these things. And then the axioms for a distributive law ensure that this is a monad. This satisfies the monad axioms. Satisfies the axioms monad axioms. Okay, so that's all very well. What about this lifting business? Let's think about the lifting business. So let's just forget about trying to make TS into a monad for uh, a second. Think about what on earth it means to make a monad on, on S alge. So if we start with an S algebra, it's got an underlying object X. This is the action, uh, the algebra action theta. Of course, there are some axioms here. What we want to do is we want to define some action that gives us a new S algebra, which is supposed to be on the underlying object. It's supposed to be given by T. Right. So what we need is for an algebra action, we have to get an algebra action from S T X to T X, because that's what S algebra would look like. Hmm. Now, if we hit this algebra with T, what would we get? Well, we'd get something not quite in the right place, because it would go from T S of X to T of X via T theta. Oh, but fancy that. We've got a lambda in here, lambda X 
that gives us exactly what we need, at least for this to look like it might be an S algebra. And lo and behold, as if by magic, the axioms give us that this really is an S algebra, and that really is a monad. So the distributive law axioms give us that T prime is a monad on S out. Okay, so so much for that bit. Now, what about this business of the, the algebras for T prime being the same as the algebras for TS? So what's an algebra for T prime? Well, the underlying object here is going to be an S algebra, okay? Because T prime is a monad on S algebras. So here's an underlying S algebra for us. Um, S x going to x, right? And here's our here's t prime of it, which goes from s t x to t s x via lambda x. Then we go via t theta to t of x. Um, right. So now we need an algebra action. So it has to be a map of s algebras going down here. So what's that? It's a map of the underlying object. So that's a phi, let's say such that this diagram commutes. Now, if you look at this a little bit carefully, what's it telling us? Well, here we've got an underlying S algebra, but actually what we've got here is also an underlying T algebra. So what this is telling us is that an algebra for T prime is something which is simultaneously an algebra for S and an algebra for T, such that they interact properly via lambda. And this makes sense, right? If you think about what a ring is, a ring is something which is both a group and a monoid, but not in any old way. It's got to be such that the group structure and the monoid structure interact properly via the distributive law. And that's exactly what this is saying. So now let's look at what um, an algebra for TS is. An algebra for TS, well, that's just something with an underlying object and and some algebra map like that, which we better call something else, let's call it psi. So you can sort of see how, given, given one of these over here, you certainly get one of those by going like that. But given one of those, how on earth do you get one of these? Well, the key is to remember that what you need is the structure of an S algebra and the structure of a T algebra. Right. So now let me just come up here a little bit. So the point is that this gives you this gives you a way of evaluating many more things than you need just to be a T algebra and an S algebra. So how can you find the T algebra action from inside here? Well, you take your you take your action and you just locate the bits that you need out of out of uh, out of T S X. So you only you only want to know for for this to be an S algebra, you only need to know where in here are the S X things. So you use you use um, you use eta. So this is going to be uh, what's it going to be? It's going to be eta t evaluated at s x. And then for the other part, you only need to find the, the t part. So you're going to go from t s using eta eta s. What's it going to be? It's going to be t t of. Wait, that's not right, is it? You want to go from t x to x, so you're going to take t of eta s evaluated x. So if you think about this in the monoids and groups case, what this is telling you is that you've thrown in lots of multiplications and additions, all kind of jumbled up on top of each other. What you want to know is where is where is the um, where is the multiplication structure? You just want the multiplication structure. So you look for it inside the place where you've got multiplication and addition. This eta picks out the places where the t structure was trivial, so all you've really essentially got is an s structure. This one picks out the place where the s structure was trivial, so you're sort of finding only the things that count as, as uh, multiplications in there. Let's see, t is, t is the free group monoid, so you're finding only the things, here you're finding only the things that have addition, where all the multiplicative parts were trivial. Ah! Uh, and basically, that gives you the outline of how you take an algebra for TS and extract from it one of these things, thereby getting that the category of those is equivalent to the category of those.